The story you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts featuring historical characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. Mark Sappington, the Kansas City Vampire He was born on February 9, 1978 and is an American serial killer convicted of murdering four acquaintances in March and April 2001 in Kansas City, Kansas. He gained notoriety for eating part of the leg of one of his victims, Alton Fred Brown. Shappington was raised by his mother, a single parent who worked hard to support herself and her son. His father had disappeared before he was even born, and they would never meet. To try and keep her son on the straight and narrow without a strong male influence, his mother insisted he attend church every Sunday. Shappington even became a choir boy, which was not common in the poverty-stricken neighborhood they lived in full of gangsters and rappers. Although he wasn't a very good student at school, there was something about Sappington that drew others to him. One young boy who became close with Sappington was 16-year-old Alton Brown who everyone called Freddy. He saw Sappington as a big brother of sorts and had a lot of admiration for him. But Sappington wasn't as innocent as he once had been. As a teenager, Sappington was hardly the perfect role model, despite his mother's best efforts. As he reached adolescence, Sappington acquired a taste for PCP, a drug which some say can make users paranoid, even psychotic. Sappington loved his danks, the street slang for cigarettes soaked in the embalming fluid, dried and then smoked. Typically, his drug use resulted in a few minor and routine encounters with the police. On March 16, 2001, Sappington's drug use resulted in the brutal and horrific murder of the young man who had considered him a brother. While trawling the streets of his North Kansas City neighborhood, Sappington struck up a casual relationship with a young man named Armando Gaitan. The younger Gaitan was the exemplar of everything that Sappington's mother had tried to prevent. Gaitan was a gangster wannabe, the cops say, a budding young tough guy who believed that he could and should live by the code of the streets. Then, in early March, Gaitan and Sappington got their hands on an assault rifle. It was a beautiful gun, the kind of weapon that lent status to a young street thug. But the only way to make themselves and the rifle truly important was to use it. So they hatched a plot to pull off an armed robbery. They didn't have any particular target in mind. Lieutenant Davenport said later, they were just searching for a random target. Along with his friend Armando Gaitan, they chose David Mashak as their target and planned to walk up to him, threaten him with the gun they had, and demand all his money and jewelry. Mashak didn't hesitate to hand over everything, but for some reason, Sabington opened fire and killed him anyway. After the murder, Gaitan fled to Texas while Sabington stayed in Kansas City. Although Gaitan was arrested a short time later, he refused to tell police the shooter's identity. His next victim was a friend named Terry Green. Because they had been friends for a long time, Green wasn't surprised when Sappington arrived on his doorstep on April 7, 2001. According to Sappington, the voices in his head took over and they instructed him to lure Green down to the basement. There. He attacked him with a hunting knife so ferociously that the walls were splattered with blood. The voices then told Sappington to drink Green's blood and he obliged by lapping it up. But Sappington left the task unfinished. He heard a noise and the voices told Sappington to dispose of the body immediately. Sappington could not have picked a more obvious place to dump Green's remains. Using his mother's car, Sappington crossed the river and entered Kansas City, Missouri. Sappington then drove to the edge of a parking lot at a nightclub he and Green frequented. He dumped the covered body into a car's back seat. On April 10, the voices once again took over and told Sappington to find another victim. He saw his friend Michael Weaver sitting outside his house. The pair struck up a conversation with Sappington suggesting they go for a drive in Weaver's car. In a shadowy alley only three blocks from Sappington's home, he fatally stabbed Weaver. Then Sappington went through the Terry Green routine. The voices told him to drink Weaver's blood, but he soon abandoned the task out of fear of discovery. Sappington fled, leaving the body behind. 
With the three of homicides behind him, Sappington was officially now a serial killer. On his way home from killing Weaver, he came across Alton Brown. Obeying the voices, he invited Brown over to his house. This time, Sappington used a shotgun to kill. Finally, Sappington was free of distractions and could quaff blood. There was one more ingredient. Sappington crudely butchered Freddy's body and then proceeded to feast upon raw flesh. His repast complete, he stuffed what was left of Freddy into a trash bag, leaving his leftovers on the basement floor. Then Sappington left the house, beginning what could be considered a post perennial stroll. Sappington's mother discovered the crimson-drenched scene a few hours later. Although she rarely ventured down to the basement, which was considered her son's territory, she could hardly ignore a trail of blood drops near and along the cellar stairs. After she had a panoramic view, Sappington's mom called police. It didn't take long for the cops to find Sappington on the street, but Sappington decided to flee, commandeering a passing car. He forced the female driver into the passenger seat and led police on a brief chase. Back at the youth detention center, Armando Gaitan, the co-conspirator in the robbery that led to Sappington's first murder, he was still refusing to name his accomplice. Based on a sketchy description from a witness to the holdup, police began to suspect that Sappington was the killer. So Gaitan's interrogators deployed perhaps the most effective tool in police work, the truth. They told Gaitan about Sappington's other horrific murders. Realizing that he was no longer protecting another neighborhood street thug, but rather a homicidal psychopath, Gaitan named Sappington. Sappington was brought into the police station for questioning after Brown's body was found in the basement of his house on April 12, 2001. During the interrogation, Sappington was linked to the other murders he had committed. Initially, he was charged with the murders of Green, Weaver, and Brown. On June 23, 2004, he was found guilty despite his defense establishing Sappington had been under the influence of PCP at the time of the murders. He has undergone a battery of psychological and psychiatric tests. Although some prosecutors say privately that they doubt Sappington's story about the voices, even the most cynical observer must conclude that this defendant suffers from a severe mental illness. As a result, prosecutors have chosen not to seek the death penalty. He was sentenced to three terms of life imprisonment, as well as a 32 months for burglary and 79 months for kidnapping. He was later convicted of the robbery and murder of Mashok and received another life sentence with the possibility of parole after serving 20 years. Sappington claimed that the voices in his head were telling him that if he didn't drink the blood or eat the flesh of humans, he was going to die. Many thought this was indicative of insanity, but in actual fact, the hallucinogenic drugs he was abusing most likely caused the auditory hallucinations. It was later discovered he had a fascination with serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, who was also fond of cannibalism. Robert Joseph Silveria Jr., also known as the Boxcar Killer, is an American serial killer currently serving double life sentences in Wyoming. For 15 years, Robert Silveria rode the rails, killing fellow freight train riders throughout the U.S. A police detective and prosecutor in Salem, Oregon, unraveled the truth of Silveria's killing spree, which began with a murder in Salem. By the end of their investigation, Silveria had confessed to murdering 28 people. Robert Joseph Silveria Jr. was born on March 3, 1959 in Redwood City, California. He was the second child born into a family with four children. At a young age, Silveria Jr. was known to have tortured a kitten. He was expelled from school and he began to experiment with drugs. In his 20s, he stole his father's truck and had a felony auto theft. He left California at the age of 21. Despite being born into a middle-class family, Silveria would go on to have a lifelong problem with alcohol and drugs. He used heroin regularly as well as meth and crack cocaine and washed it all down with alcohol. If there was anything he could get a high out of, he would take it. 
His father got Silveria into many different jobs at the airport where he worked, but he lost each and every one of them due to his substance abuse. He had been married, but his wife left. Unable to tolerate the drugs and alcohol and Silveria's habit of wandering off. At that time, there was a group called the Freight Train Riders of America or FTRA, a group who spent their days and nights riding the boxcars of the freight trains. It was originally founded by returned Vietnam War veterans, but before long, others were able to join including Silveria. To show he was a member, Silveria always carried a bandana with him as well as a flashback button. This button identified him as being a member of a group called the Wrecking Crew. It was their job to maintain control and order amongst the FTRA members. The FTRA became associated with multiple crimes on the freight trains including robbery and assault. And for drug adult Silveria, who suffered from an internal rage he had trouble controlling, these assaults would often go way too far. As Silveria rode the freight trains, he found there was a high supply of potential victims for him. He generally attacked men who were homeless, no matter their race or age. He preferred to beat his victims to death with his hands and a large stick he called a goon stick. Sometimes they were killed by metal poles or rocks, whatever was at hand at the time. Silveria didn't try to hide or dispose of the bodies after the murders. He just left them beside the railroad. Once the victim was dead, he would take their belongings, especially items he thought he could use or sell, including money and drugs. He also took the person's identification so he could collect welfare benefits and food stamps. Silveria was fully aware of a rage he had inside him, and he would start out by meeting a homeless transient, spend some time partying with them, and then create an excuse to get angry with them. Then he would beat them to death and let all the rage out. The body of Michael Seitz was found on a train in Oregon, and the detective in charge of the case was able to locate others who had been on the train at the same time. They said that the last person they saw with Seitz was Sidetrack. Others referred to the man as Silveria. The detective initially thought it was two people, not realizing they were one. According to the witnesses, Silveria and Seitz had gone in search of drugs. Notices were distributed to all law enforcement agencies to try and find Sidetrack or Silveria. On March 2, 1996, Silveria was caught in California and taken into custody. In the interview room, it was discovered that Sidetrack and Silveria were the same person. Silveria claimed that God told him to surrender and he confessed to the murders of William Petit and Michael Seitz. Throughout his interrogation, he continued to confess to a number of murders he had committed. He provided drawn maps to show where each murder had taken place and gave details on each killing. This information showed that he had been a part of 14 murders at least. Silveria went on three trials for murder. He was found guilty on January 30, 1998, February 17, 1998, and May 20, 1998 of all three murder charges. Because he had agreed to a plea bargain, he received life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. In total, Silveria confessed to committing 47 murders, but police suspect he was involved in just 14. Because of the nature of the crimes and the transiency of the people killed and the perpetrator, many cases may never be solved. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took the time to listen to my narration. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I am Twisted Mind and please enjoy the rest of your day. Salamat.